Hello, everybody. Welcome to Oregon State University's Permaculture Design Pro Class. This is our last office hour for the fall winter 2023 session. Uh, after this, you folks have a couple of weeks to get your final designs in. All designs, all designs, all resubmissions, everything must be in by December 4th at 9 a.m. There is no extension. Now, if I give you feedback for you to fix something in your assignment 10, can you resubmit after? December 4th, of course, but all assignments must be in on that date at that time because grades have to be in and we roll over to the new course and all those things happen. So that's the that's the nuts and bolts of that conversation. Um, Ashley's asked a great question uh, coming off of some feedback I gave her in class. So hello, I was asked about making a more cohesive design with the last assignment. I wanted to give some context and clarification. I love the idea of directing the water from the gutters into a swale path that would feed the proposed kitchen garden on the front lawn. But I've also included some photos below to see if it's even possible given the grade of the site and the sidewalk being totally in the way. Do you have suggestions for this? Yes, 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 we do. So um, generally we can see the contour or we can see the elevational change uh, from what I can see from these photos. And actually you can let me know. Up here kind of feels high and down here feels lower. Is that roughly right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So we can probably do some design conversations off that. And then we've got a gutter here we can see. Um, mm -hmm. we're gonna go back to your base map. And you did a lovely drawn base map, which I so appreciate. It's such Thank a you. Done it. Um, okay, so we've got some gutters and downspouts. So we've got some red lines here. So over here, we've got gutters and downspouts. We'll, uh, we'll zoom in. Too close. Let's see if it wants to work. Okay, great. So basically, we've got a water access point here and a water access point here. So we've got one and we've got two. And so we go back to that photo just so everyone is clear on what we're doing. We've got this one up here, which is high, and this one down here. I think it's here. Is this? Yeah, this is the one we're seeing yeah. here. Well. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. So during, I kind of want to do this on the iPad, actually. Maybe that's what we'll do. It's just easier to draw it. We could mouse draw. I did find my little Wacom tablet when I was packing. Oh, and now there's no battery power to this one. I guess when I plugged it in last night, it didn't work. Okay, we'll, we'll mouse draw. Um, so one of the things we were talking about, and we'll, we'll jump back and forth between uh, this base map and uh, these photos so we can kind of render in real time. So everyone's uh, familiar. Photo one, let's bring up the annotation here. Uh, we'll put me over here so it's all together. Oh, let's go back to the mouse. There we go. We'll undo that line. Okay. So, so everyone's familiar. I'm going to take a stamp. So, photo one is, oh, all right. Still totally not used to the new, uh, the new tools. Photo one is coming this way. So, if we go back to, this conversation here. So that's photo one. It's looking towards there. This is looking towards there. And then uh, photo two is looking back out. So it's these stairways. So standing here looking this way and then same and then top of the hill looking down. So that's up here looking down. So one of the things when we're designing is always thinking about contour. And um, I'm not saying these contours are right, but to save the time of going and grab them from contour map generator, getting them and sketching them and bringing them in. You know, it kind of looks like the contours are kind of like so, I'm not saying they're perfect, but kind of looks like they're so like this. Did you say that's roughly right, Ashley? Yep, yeah. Cool. So one of the things I'd mentioned because she had done a great design, um, in the previous design, I think it was the zone one design and the plant design. And again, great renders, like super beautiful, easy to read, easy to understand, um, was this kitchen garden down here. And one of the things I was talking about during the feedback was what I might try to do is actually bring that water out a little bit more and then work on it um, in sort of a, a swale or a terrace conversation. Now, you could choose either, you could choose swale or terrace. I think for this, it would be just as easy to do swale and it would be less work. So probably a good good way to do it. Let's roll this up here. So yeah, the, the two little things I was talking about, and sorry, I'm just gonna check and see what this retaining wall spigot 
Okay. Oh, retaining wall, spigot. Got it. Was when you're working in this kind of situation where there's a house and a walkway is you can design or create, um, uh, design or create a trellis. And this was a system that, uh, I, th I thought of years ago and then started to see all over the place. So when we think of good ideas, know that everybody else is having, having them at the same time. So basically it would be a trellis that kind of comes up here, comes up here, comes across, kind of a nice welcome home. But the nice thing about this is we can then bring this downspout, we can bring it down to here, bring it over here, and now it's actually usable. So now we actually have that water to be used. And same thing down here, it would be the exact same conversation. So we would take something like um, trellis on this side, and then this side, and then we'd have to refine this design to make sure it was happy and all those good things. But um, these are just general ideas. There we go. So then the pipe would come down here and then come down here. Okay, so now we actually have water coming out of the, uh, away from the house, which is what downspouts and French drains do. But now it's actually going to go into some productive use. So first things first, Ashley, um, this pond, is this pond staying? So I want to kind of rework it. It's just okay. like a concrete hole in the ground, basically. But I want to actually put like a liner in there and make it a little bit nicer and a more natural shape um and actually make it like functional oh gotcha yeah great idea and then quickly what what door is the closest door to the kitchen because this will be the kitchen so garden. you're literally pointing right to it that back little patio right there yeah my kitchen is right inside of that little back porch right there and that's actually the door that we use for our front door Amazing. We, okay, we just like to come up and walk around and then go back there. Wonderful. Okay. So in this situation, what I'd probably do is take this water and then put it into some kind of either a uh, swale, open swale system or closed swale system. I think in this, I probably do an open. Um, so basically you'd have a swale that came out like this. Um, I'd probably run a little bit of perforated big O for maybe 10, 15 feet, just to make sure that it, it, it went away. Um, and wasn't necessarily just pooling here. So I'd probably bring it to the center. And uh, and then well, I'd probably fill this with wood chips. So basically we'd have a mound on this side. And this is why I was asking about the, the concrete planter, because this may not be the best spot for it, depending on the design. So, you know, if you do it or not, it's fine. We're just kind of talking about design conversations. So mm -hmm. I'd probably um, fill this with mulch and then we would have our first, uh, our first bed. Um, now, one of the one of the the no nos in design is uh, swale huga cultures. So, usually the berm isn't a hu a huga culture mostly because it gets too saturated and holds on to too much water. The idea is, is that huga cultures get wet seasonally through regular rain intervals. They soak up water and then they dissipate water either because of their off contour access, the drainage of the soil. Um, or the plants using them, or all three. So when you put a swale with a hugo culture, it tends to get oversaturated and tends to go anaerobic, which we don't want because it's a terrestrial environment. We want it to stay with, with oxygen. So I would probably do one of two things. Either, and we could talk about your climate. You're in New York. You're in a humid climate. You really don't have a big drought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd go swale. Um, if you were more in a wet environment, I'd probably lean towards hugo culture. And instead... So for everybody else who's in a drier uh, climate, what I would do, um, and funny enough, uh, after I did the design example for this class for my dad's place in Calgary and gave him the design directive to take his downspout and put it into a hookah culture, he did it and he's been growing strawberries now, which is pretty, pretty awesome. So basically what I would do is I would take a big old pipe and then I would put a hookah culture around it. And then this would be that. Uh. So that way it's feeding it and it's charging it and, and working it. But I think because you're too, you're kind of too humid or you've got consistent rain events. I don't know if I would be as interested in doing that. I wouldn't mind a hookah culture down here in between, but because this first water conversation will feed the top portion of this design, I'd probably just put it into that, that pathway, put the pathway down with um, wood chips 
And what will happen in a humid climate like yours, within two or three years, you'll have soil that you can dig out from underneath the mulch at the bottom of that uh, of that pathway. So your pathways are growing soil and your garden beds are growing food, which is great because you can basically harvest all of this and put it on top. Um, I don't think I talked about this last time because I don't think my buddy was there yet, but a good good friend, colleague, actually my, my initial teacher in my PDC in 09, then became one of my best friends. Um, he took over for me when I stopped going to Africa and he's been doing it now for 10 years. He's there now. <clears throat> they weren't able to go during COVID, just going back now. Monster swales, had no rain. This is really important. Had really no rain, like maybe two or three inches of rain over the last three years. And because in Africa, when it rains, well, not all of Africa, but definitely Kenya, because it's a hot, hot, dry tropics. All the swales filled up with soil and then decomposed because all the material got mixed in there and they just mined the swales for soil for the last uh, week and a half. So all that to say, we've got we've got a great kind of first step here in terms of what we're looking at. So I'm going to do everything on the render first and then we'll transfer it to the plan because if I switch back and forth, the I'll show you like this, this will just stay with me because this is just through um, uh, Zoom. Okay, <clears throat> so yeah, I would get the right marker. There we go. And then we would have kind of our first swell that would come along here and then our first mound that would come along here. Now, because this is kitchen and because as soon as you come out, I would make sure that any of my zone one plants are here. So all of my culinary mints or call pardon me, culinary herbs that I'm using for kitchen. So my thymes, my savories, my basils, my rosemaries, um, anything that's quick and come again, your green onions, uh, mint, um, all of that would kind of, this would like half of this swale would be sort of zone one garden. Um, and again, could be a mound, could be a box, could be anything. It's it's really dependent upon you and, and the style you want to work in. Uh, from this top to down here, is this like, what is this, like six feet? So this must be like four, four and a half feet, maybe the drop between here and here? Yeah, maybe a little bit more. Um, okay, five, six? But probably about that. Yeah, like okay. five, six. So I think the swale is the easier option um, and kind of doing guard beds that way is the easier option. Uh, probably the option that would look better is if you did, um, got, if you terraced it and then did like a rock wall and terraced it more time, more money, etc. So this is, I'm always going for the easiest first. So I think this would be the easiest. And then in between here, um, depending on your comfortability, I like pathways to be um, back tine wheelbarrow width. So I think it's like, I think it's like, Four, my favorite wheelbarrow is like, I think 14 inches. So I'd set your pathways at that. And then I don't like beds that I can't reach um, over both sides if I'm doing quick come again uh, agriculture. So generally I'm keeping things at 30, 30 inch beds so I can straddle them. In this situation, you're never really going to straddle downhill. So I'd be willing to increase the size of those beds so that way I could at least reach fully in from one side and fully in from the other side to get the upper and lower portion. Um, and that's all body mechanics. This is really where we start to get real specific in terms of you as a person and, and how you operate. So if, you know, if I'm standing here and I want to be able to reach to the center of this bed, so I'm going to be able to reach over and reach over. So in my case, that would be usually um, we'd be moving to about four feet that makes a bigger bed that I can reach in from one side and reach in from the other. But I have a, a little bit too much German in me and I like things to be uh, more efficient than sometimes is useful. So that would be your width. And then what I would do down here is I'd probably, you could experiment down here. Um, you could experiment here with hookah culture instead and put down, you know, dig your trench and dig your hoogles. And then I'd probably do the same down here. And then I would go back to that same system we did at the beginning. I would then do uh, a swale, um, bring in that water, put it on wood chips, and then have the mound on top. And now, because this is more a zonal conversation, um, I'm going to switch to the plan. Does this make sense um, to you, Ashley? So the it's literally like a wood chip path right like where the trench where the swale is and then you're talking about doing cubiculture like next to it off of it yeah well th this would be just a swale okay. well that's the swale yeah because you don't want to mix them 
And yep. then this would be our hygge culture and this would be our hygge culture. And then as many, okay. as few as you can work with your pathways. That's what Leo's all about. Like putting your pathways at, you know, whatever you want. That's why I gave you my thought, like 14 inches yeah. and take a wheelbarrow. So if I need to, to mulch or, or weed or harvest or whatever, um, but uh, you can also go super tiny and you go six inches. And then if you're doing high intensity agriculture, it's like six inch walkway, 30 inch bed, six inch walkway. And then like every few or at the ends, you, cause you could, you could leave the wheelbarrow back here and then you could, you could walk down, do what you need to do and come back. And generally when I'm doing high intensity agriculture, that's what I do. But it just, I think this is going to look better as sort of a more robust like beautiful garden yeah bigger so paths yeah. bigger paths kind of give that feel of, of of openness and spaciousness and sensibility so yeah that's kind of what I was thinking yeah I agree so if we did um let's do a cross section just so it's really clear uh so if this is our cross section let's move my big old face out of the way cool and then if this is our cross section over here um because we're on a on a slope um, so what it would look like is we'd have the swale at the bottom. Oops, it wants to, we'd have the swale at the bottom. We'd have that big old pipe coming in and then we'd have wood chips on top. And then we'd probably have a hoogle, which would be great because the hoogle would decompose um, pretty well with water right beside it. And then we'd have you know our pathway. Um, and then we do a, probably another hoog, the trench there, another pathway, another hoog. And then we probably get up to the swale pathways. So we have the mound. And again, I see. They go right. So that's kind of what we're seeing here. We're seeing this you know, swale pathway, a hoog uh, pathway, um, hoog, hoog and swale and then pathway 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 make sense all right yeah okay very cool thank you yeah and then as we're moving over to this guy we'll kind of show the conversation from up top so this comes across so this ends up becoming the swale pathway swale trail and then that pipe again would come across over here and then would kind of go through maybe 10 20 feet in um and you may need to to augment this down these tree roots might get in the way so you may need to move mm -hmm. this a little bit down then we have our our mound so this would be our mound and then we would go into our hoogs so we'd have um let's do different actually you know what if i increase the color and move to marker hold on highlighter versus vanishing pen okay well let's do highlighter and then our pathway let's say will be brown nice so that's pathway and then we'll augment these depending on what trees or what we want to keep or we might you know hopscotch this um i think i was doing purple for hygge culture so then we've got our hoog and then we've got our pathway and then we've got our hoog And then it comes over here. Yeah, we'll probably do one more pathway. So this upper pathway would probably be that same pathway like up here. We'll go back to the color scheme. So this would be the pathway here. And then we'd have this pipe come across some kind of open area and then kind of 10, 15 feet in. And then we'd have that bottom, um, uh, that, that bottom swale as well. Like this and then in terms of our zonation i i i kind of see it as think of think of coming out of the house as the epicenter um so if we layer on top of this if we layer on like circles and we go with our zonation this is kind of coming out of the house that's that's kind of the zone the zone one garden and then coming out a little bit further we kind of have our zone two and then maybe our zone three. And this all may be zone one because it's so close to the house of kind of doing this for um, explanation. So that way, you know, if you wanted to have this further out, you know, along here towards the end of it, th these could be either your berry bushes. So you're in New York. So things like 
yosterberry, gooseberry, um, blueberry. Uh, and then if you wanted to do a trellis, because trellis is probably going to be the tallest, trellis would probably go at top. So we'd probably, what's that looking like? Oh, I'm still in circle. Um, probably do a trellis up here. Whenever you're ready to get off circle, just take your time. <laughs> there we go. All right. So trellis might go up here. That's super thin. But I haven't said I dislike these new things. Let me say it now. So trellis might go up here. Um, so you could get, um, you know, whatever this is. What is this? 50 feet. Yeah, you could get a 50 foot row in of raspberries or, or ulalis or tays or logans. Um, something that produces uh, incredibly. And especially if we've got this swale here, then we're also capturing all this water that's coming down here. Um, if at any point we end up seeing that um, this swale completely fills up with water, um, and we may want to do this conscientiously, is we may want to make a level sill spillway kind of about here if we extended this um, if we extended this swale all the way down, which I'm feeling like we should now. Okay, where's the marker? There we go. So let's say this, this swell goes all the way over here. Um, what we would want to do then is come back in and make sure that there is a level sill spillway probably somewhere towards the end because we want to keep that overflow further away from the house. We don't want it close to the house. And then, of course, it'll flow into the next pathway in the hoover culture. Um, but yeah, trellis up there and then maybe berry bushes below. Now, again, we don't want to put berry bushes into hoover culture. So this may this may change our design. This is This is the the looping, the spiraling of design, that if the plants then dictate a different type of earthwork, maybe this then turns into a swale halfway through, or maybe it's a swale the total way through. Um, and then we do all of our our, our berry bushes. Um, we start our berry bush down here. So we've got our, our bushes down here. Um, and then using up all of this area. Um, so again, it's hopefully I'm making the point that far away from the house would be those berry bushes that you would only really visit, yeah. you know, once a season where you're doing uh, composting, an inch of composting on it, half an inch of composting, move the mulch away, put the compost on, put the mulch back on and then harvest. So you don't need to be out there that much. And then these first couple of rows would be your quick cut and come agains, and then moving into your lettuces and then moving further into your, your, your different, um, different types of you know i could see your row crops being down here your potatoes your uh, turnips your parsnips um i might even add uh i might make this whole thing a trellis um and do tomatoes on the top here um because if you're if you're interested in field tomatoes this can be a great way to do it just you know a couple of rolls one on the top one on the bottom and then you can access them from either sides um and what else would i do here yeah, so same thing down here. I'd probably do a, if this goes all the way to the end, this uh, the eraser, this vanishing pen, the eraser. Oh, it just slowly evaporates. That's fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're fun tools until they're not, really. Um, and then what were we using? Okay, we were using brown. Okay, so swale is a brown on the bottom. Can't do a color. You have to switch it to this first. Man, they've made this more complicated, kind of needlessly so. Okay, so this is a swale at the bottom. Let's try it again. Have you ready? Just take your time. All right, there we go. All right, so if we do a swale at the bottom again, again, probably that overflow you want to be over here. Um, and then, you know, you're doing a pretty, I think over here you were doing more of a pollinator garden is that right yeah yeah Remember more perfect? so than like anything that i would get a yield from more okay. so just like rain garden stuff cool um and so yeah you could consider you could continue this pattern all the way down to the bottom um generally if i'm doing rows like this i kind of like to do little um kind of sprays of color on the end so i tend to do kind of sprays of color of perennial um I'm putting these in the pathways. I've totally forgotten my scheme. Um, I like to do, you know, self-seeding annuals in terms of flowers or 
um, low low growing annual um, insectiaries, you know, bee balm, lavender. Um, and then usually like halfway through the bed, I'll do kind of the same thing. If you're, if you're going with wabi-sabi, don't, don't put it directly beside each other. You can just make it, um, if you're going for more of an aesthetic design, you kind of put them wherever, um, just to kind of give it more of a, a loose feel. Uh, you'll find that it'll, it'll just give that more of a kind of scatter pattern. Same thing as the tree conversation, but, um, again, I'm more German. So uh, I kind of like them every 25 feet. It also helps to demark my rows. So I know exactly what's in between those rows. So if I'm planting something, it's like, okay, between lavender and bee balm on swale one, I know that I've got in a crop of spinach. And then between the next one, I know I've got in a crop of bush beans. And I know when those dates are, and I know when it's going to come out so I can go and grab them. But I've also become more of an aesthetic designer over the years. So I like having these little sprays of color and also they're insectiaries, they, they increase pollination, all that makes good sense. Um, and then this may actually demark when you're going into perennial culture, maybe. Maybe that's what this is. It's kind of like before the lavender bushes, you have all of your perennial, your annuals. And then after them, you have all your perennials. Um, one thing I would be conscientious of is to have stepping stones in between these. This is the thing that nobody thinks of. So if you're walking down here and you want to kind of come down and take a look at the end, you're not going to walk all the way down and come this way. Everyone says that on paper. And then when you work it, nobody does that because it's a pain. So, you know, stepping stones, even with the hookah culture, what you do is you just build your hookah culture a little low there. Still, you know, still woods, the core, the bottom is still the same, but like just a couple of stepping stones to get down or little areas, pathways to come down. You can make it look really beautiful that way with some flagstones that kind of move in between. And then of course, material grows up in between them. I like woolly thyme personally in your, your biome in between rock looks really nice. It's easy to walk on. It's no problem, but yeah. And then I would extend all of these down towards the end. Um, and then I, I probably just continue the pattern all the way down. If you are looking at trees, trees would go up here and then you would do your trellises and then you would do your berry bushes. Just thinking of orders in terms of your your structure and then if you wanted to do away with the rectilinear which is totally fine you don't have to go with the rectilinear this is totally just my approach to it um what i would do then is with your swale if you brought in that that first one um and i'm gonna go back to the marker and back to the thick marker so the swale will have to be on contour there's no way to get around that but after that, if you wanted kind of more meandering, that next one wouldn't have to be, you know, you could, you could play around with those meanders nice. um, and kind of make a more curvilinear, but those first two would kind of be your anchor points. So if we, if we undid these two, and so like this would be contour. And then this first one, I think I totally forgot the contours I drew. I'm just going to do it again. Um, let's bring this back. Cool. So I think it was roughly like this and kind of roughly like this. So in between here, you yeah. could have all that curvilinear that we were seeing in the rest of your design as a as a piece of your design language. And so you could do you could even do the same thing you did before, um, where you kind of had this serpentine conversation or even a, a place to be someplace in the garden, either be it a feature or a thinking spot or a sit spot or a little shed or gazebo or you know something of that nature. Or I don't know if you guys have a fire. Yeah. Maybe that's what this is. Yeah. That's the fire pit. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, are you thinking of putting in like a clay oven or anything in this design? So not really. Um, okay. We have, we really hang out like on the back patio. We have a smoker back there. We have our grill back there. We have like, you know, like seating and everything on the patio. Um, yeah. My boyfriend is really big on golf. His next thing is to get a golf simulator and it's still a shed and put it back there. Oh, okay. um, gotcha. So that would really be like the hangout spot. And then the front where we're talking about the garden would be like my spot because I'm gotcha. always in the garden. Gotcha. So gotcha. One of the things for personal for personal design is I like putting in a spot for people to be in the place that they're managing. So again, if it's just a like a meditation spot or a sit spot or a place to go and write or a place to go and enjoy the garden, it's really nice to have a place yeah. inside the garden to enjoy. So mm -hmm. consider that someplace in, in depending. Yeah, I really like that idea. Yeah. 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 I, I picked that up from a mentor of mine who always had a gazebo with um, 
either passion flower or um, honeysuckle or some of the hardy kiwis that have these big, beautiful pink leaves, the cola mitkas and the argudas, and always had like two or three outdoor patio furnitures. And that's where he would host. That's where he would like bring people and have tea or had his birthday out there. Um, but I, if that becomes the center point, this is just how different design can be depending on what the, the output is. So if that's what it's going to be and say it's here, then all of a sudden you're going to start to make, you know, structure around that. So, you know, there's a spray of color yeah. around you. There's probably a spray of, um, I don't know, factory spray in terms of like, you want to have something like, I don't know, Rhybes Odoratum, which is a cinnamon smelling uh, current that uh, stays on the bush and is fresh for like up to three months, but smells like cinnamon. I love putting them by doors just because it's like, or even pathways like coming in. So if like everyone's coming in and out of here, a little Rhybes Odoratum there would be lovely because you're always going to smell it coming in and out or lilac or yeah, you know, the conscious, the conscientiousness of, of olfactory design is, is really important for enjoying a space and coming in and out. But um, that's kind of what I was thinking overall. How does that land thoughts, challenges, queries? I think that that's absolutely beautiful. And I would have never even thought to do like the uh, the trellis idea with the gutters that's why i thought am i gonna have to like dig under my sidewalk like how am i gonna do this but when you said go over i'm like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> it's it's amazing because as well like if you ever wanted to plumb in because this is that retaining wall if you ever wanted to plumb in like a rain tank here all you'd have to do is extend the trellis and then you'd actually have water up 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 top that you could use and it and because it's like inside the trees it'd be easy to clad and it would be easy to kind of like integrate into it um yeah. in a design like this i'd probably have a compost kind of mid um mid slope uh so that way if if there was if there was a need or a desire if you're going to chop and drop and grab all the stuff like bring everything back and up becomes problematic so in my garden which is like 2,600 square feet here. I had a compost at the end and I had a compost at the front. Um, and what I found is if I was at the end of the garden, it was easy just to put into that pile. Um, I probably also make a pretty specific pathway this way as well. I'm totally eschewing my, uh, my, my color scheme. I probably do a pathway at the back here as well. Um, just so that way, if you, you, if you did, if you were kind of doing the shopping aisle uh, shuffle, you could come up one way down the other and kind of work the garden that way. People forget about accessibility and it's just the worst once it's designed because you're always, there's always going to be something you don't do because of lack of accessibility. If you can't get to a place, it won't be, it won't be managed. You'll just be like, eh, I don't care about it yeah. and it'll suffer. So yeah. cool. Yeah. I think that's um, awesome. Great. Any, any questions, any follow-up questions from you and then from anybody else either um, questions about this? Or I think I'm, good okay you just got my brain turned <laughs> <laughs> cool that's great uh from anybody else any questions from anybody i'm just going to check the chat okay i have a question not related to this so uh, okay. i want to make sure if it's related to this that goes first yeah let's see if anybody else has another question related to this okay go for it all right um, so it's kind of an odd question. I don't even know if it's within the realm of permaculture. Um, I saw this video by David Holmgren and he was talking about how when he goes to a space, he um, likes to kind of let the space kind of speak to him a bit. And it seemed like he was alluding to something beyond just observation and drinking in the space, you know? It reminded me of something that I learned about where um, my understanding is that the anthropological research shows that most people's learned how to use medicinal plants by some kind of shamanistic or like psychic apprehension of the plants telling them how to use it. It wasn't really like a trial and error type thing. So it speaks to like a kind of like intuitive, you know, animal plant communication type deal. And I just wondered if there's any, if this lives anywhere in this space and with anyone who does a niche of like intuitive design with permaculture. Great question. Excellent. Okay. Excellent question. So yes, it's a, uh, it's a big part of design and coming from somebody who's uh, a recovering overthinker, it was introduced okay. to me first by actually Brandon, who I was talking about before in Kenya, who had a lot of dream space design. So he, he allowed to like input a lot of the design site into him over time, but 
most of his insights would come when he was dreaming or come when he was doing mindless act, mindless activities or for him smoking. <laughs> um, there's folks that will we'll be on <laughs> will be on the spectrum of this. And uh, the first story that comes to mind is Wade Davis. If you haven't read One River by Wade Davis or listened to his Wayfinders lectures through uh, CBC in Canada, highly recommend it. He's a, a biological anthropologist, so he or botany. Um, so he works at the intersectionality of people and plants. And so he was down in the Amazon jungle working with these karatos, these shamans, and they'd come to really respect Wade um, up until this point. And so he asked a question as academics are wont to do. And he said, uh, how do you know which two plants came together to make ayahuasca? Because it's two plants that come together. And their answer was like, what, like you're asking what do you put over socks, shoes, if you're going outside? And they said, you can't hear the plants sing. And he goes, what? And he goes, well, the plants sing to each other. And that's how you know what, what to combine to them. And it took him a long time to actually get the trust of the tribe back. Because at that point, they thought he was um, mentally unbalanced because he couldn't hear the plants singing. So there is a much larger conversation that we have largely ignored or atrophied the intuition or the vibrational receptors in our body to what's around us and what's happening. Um, the people who niche in it and are really good at helping people bring that out of them, I would say is Starhawk and her earth activist training, or specifically her, um, her training in, in connecting with and being with plants in the garden at a, at a vibrational concept and being, um, having met Starhawk and taught with her, um, she has a pretty good handle on the the witchery side of this conversation. And if you're interested in that, you know that's that's a, a potential route. My route was always to develop uh, an intimate spiritual connection with any site I was in by going through a very specific process where I try to empty my mind. Tom Brown, who's the very famous. Uh, tracker and, and ancestral skills trainer down in the states talks about that the the human mind is the is the loudest thing in the forest what does it sound like it sounds like a trash can going down suburban alleyway at three in the morning it's loud it's always trying to process and so my approach to that to quiet my mind was generally before i do a sight walk i meditate i try to focus on the thoughts that are coming up and to let them go I also try to be open to and invite in any wisdom on the site. And it's something I do even when I'm working digitally. You know, what's the wisdom of this site? What's what's the ancestral story of this site? What what has it been since time immemorial? Um, what does it still want to be? And how do we harmonize with that instead of force functioning a specific design onto the landscape? I will to this day continue to advocate against the herb spiral because I think it takes way too much water. And it's just, a, it's just like picked off the permaculture shelf and stamped onto a landscape. It very rarely integrates with the landscape itself. It's a, it's a cute little something or other that probably belongs more on a Pinterest board than it does on the maintenance of somebody. Cause I'm, I'm so conscientious about maintenance because it takes so much time and effort to do this stuff that you want to, you want to be able to, move the wood pile once, so to speak. So you're not constantly, you know, moving wood three or four times similarly. And this is what came into the design conversation with Ashley. By coming to a site, I want the things that I need right away up front. Um, so it's kind of funny. I'm glad you asked me this question. I've, I've been thinking about this a bunch. Maybe that's why you asked me or vice versa. And it's funny. I've, I've been thinking about this for weeks. I just, um, you know, this stuff is like a little bit out of norm and I didn't know if it would be a weird question in the space, but then this is the last day. So I'm like, okay, Anything let's just ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like when I looked at Ashley's design and I did this while I was, I was talking with you, I didn't talk about it internally, but I look at the heart as the home, you know, this is where everybody is. This is where everybody's interacting. And so anything that they would constantly be interacting with, you want close to the home. Um, one of the bigger arguments I had with my husband was when he wanted to put the wood fired pizza oven 45 feet away from the house and not out the back door. Biggest argument we ever had. He's like, well, there's a, we have an old fuel shed over there. We'll use it. We'll use it there. It's like, dude, 
if I'm making a pizza, I want to go into the house, get my ingredients, come out, host people, talk around it. I don't want to walk 45. He's like, we got so much land. Why don't we use it? It's like, no, that's not the point of land. This is a manifest destiny. We're not spreading out for the rest of time, for the rest of time. So the other story I'll give you is, uh, I, and I think I've actually already told it in this class, but uh, I was asked to take a look at this site because I was there with a buddy of mine and he was a bison farmer and uh, he said, I'm really trying to turn this little wetland into a pasture. How can I do that? I was like, give me some time. And I really opened myself up just to the wisdom of the site. And I tell the story in a more ac academic and more sort of um, ecological timeline narrative usually. But what really happened in my mind was I saw, I saw the advent of humans coming onto that land. I saw the advent of an ice age. I saw the advent of likely the tectonic shifts that created Vancouver Island and, and brought it into being. And the whole time I just continually saw this like trickle of rain that was coming down this like miles of area and was coming through and coming through this little piece of land and kind of saw it kind of in a animation artistic render where it would like, it would flourish and come back and flourish and come back. And the whole time it was a wetland from beginning to end from this millennia, millions, hundreds of millions of years that happened in my mind's eye. And I'm not thinking, I'm just asking for wisdom. I'm, I'm, I'm reaching out to be inspired by the landscape. And as I'm doing it, and as I'm perceiving this, a more rational uh, right brain conversation comes up and goes, this has always been a wetland. It'll always be a wetland. This guy's moving against literally a mountain to try and make it something else. I was like, ah, oh, okay. So I'm going to have to say no to a client, which is why my approach is I, I do what's called a feasibility report first, because my job is not to give you what you want. My, my job is to tell you the inherent characteristic of the landscape and how that matches up with what you want and where it would best go. So he came back and I chatted with him. I was like, hey, man, this has been a wetland before people were here. It's a wetland now. It'll be a wetland after humans are gone because 99.99% .99 of life on planet Earth is gone never never to be again humans will have their end as well and i said the best thing you could do is harmonize with this wetland i'd probably terrace it if it's not a named stream because then it triggers the water sustainability act i'd probably terrace it kind of put some benches on there the lower areas i'd probably put water loving plants uh upper areas i i'd put some drier and then i'd probably put fodder plants at the end i'd fence it off so that way the bison aren't in there and then i would use it to feed the animals with tree fodder and then i would i would i would, I would do uh you know fiber pharmaceuticals or food for people kind of in and where that water is because it's brilliant you're in a drought prone area and you always have water it's kind of a great thing and if you're really keen we might do a little impoundment higher up so that way you've got a body of water that can then feed things and he said uh i think it was like over the past five years he had seen five consultants and uh, it's been ten thousand dollars getting their opinions uh, the last guy wanted to strip all the topsoil, get down to parents, bring in more fill, fill up the wetland, because that'll stop the mountain from being there and forcing water onto your landscape, um, and then put the topsoil over. And he goes, yours is the smartest thing I've heard. But I, it wasn't me being smart. It was me open, me being open to the resonance of that landscape, because I didn't, I didn't actively put the pieces together. I just sat there and absorbed what the land was. And I think that also comes from Tom Brown and then from Brandon in that I try to approach the site from like three feet high, like a kid. So like around like six, seven, eight, where I just have wonder about the site. Like, huh, I wonder what that's about. Huh, I wonder what that's about. And this this really came funny enough full circle because you talked about David Holmgren. This comes full circle to a story I was told that when David Holmgren uh, came to Lost Valley Educational Center down in the States, he met with... Um, Rick, Rick Valley, who's this incredible permaculturalist and bamboo grower and just impeccable human. And David didn't know the temperate plants of coastal Oregon. Um, and of course, Rick didn't know many of the tropical plants, but David decoded the entire landscape with Rick on this walk. A buddy of mine was walking behind him and he experienced the whole thing where David was like, oh, I'm seeing this type of plant in this format, in this shape, in this wet area but with a bit of sun 
and I'm not seeing it in full sun, this plant is an, an uh, is like a plant I have in, in my biome. Uh, does this plant do this functionality? And Rick was like, yeah. And so David literally decoded the whole landscape by reading it. And he actually just put out a, a great documentary that he and my late colleague and friend Dan Palmer put together uh, called Reading the Landscape, um, where he goes into that process. So I would say my design these days is probably probably burgeoning on 60% um, channel and intuition, just being open to the site, open to what makes sense. And then proofing or challenging it with a more academic lens, a more practical farmer lens. Um, and then going back and forth, kind of going back and forth between like, well, the land spoke to me and it said this. And then the other side being like, well, that would make sense if this was true. And then I go and look at this aspect of it. I'm like, oh, it is true. Of course it is. Because usually the channeling and just opening yourself to the wisdom of the land produces more insights than anything else um, in my experience. And then it creeps into your dreams. Um, I've just been going through all my old designs, all my old transparency and vellum designs and all that. And uh, it's amazing how many of the first designs were just like, must get it right, must put the right plant in the right place. Um, and just so much of that academic, you know, over meritocracy within our, our, our culture is. And then as you get to the end of the designs, it's very much more like, huh, I wonder how the water flows here. And, and I remember sitting in some of these places and just watching it kind of in my mind's eye, like a well, water would fall there and then come here, it would kind of spread out there, but it would also be falling here at the same time. Cool. So that's like a neat place to capture. And that's what I was doing with Ashley's is it's, you know, this is why we say contours or blue lines, blue flow lines, because um, you kind of want to get a sense of where all this is. So it's like, cool, you have all this resource water that likely will be falling here. And if this is five feet fall, then chances are this is gonna be a bit more of a fall. So this water is coming here. So all we have to do is capture it in some way, shape or form, but we have to capture it so that way the people can access it and they won't get tired if they're doing their lettuces out here or they, they won't go and grab it. They just won't put in their meals. So it all becomes that sense of overlapping overlays where yeah, there's an earthwork conversation. Yeah, there's a zonal conversation. Yeah, there's a microclimate conversation that will influence. But a big portion of it, um, Louisa, and you hit it on the head, is just being open to the wisdom of the site and quieting the monkey mind. That was awesome and lovely. Thank you so much for sharing all that. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I could I could talk for much longer and probably shouldn't. So, yeah, no worries. But, Any other questions? Like you said what you said about the um, must put the right plant in the right place kind of really resonated with me because I think as I start, I mean, I'm way behind with my design. I'm hopefully we'll be able to cobble something together to finish it. But um, I definitely, when I first started trying to get into the actual design, I got very bogged down into what specific plant should I place in this specific location? And I got very lost in all the options there were. Um, and so that, that very much resonated with me and is, I definitely I need to take a step back and just worry a little bit less about the very specific minute details and more about the overview. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, I think this is why, and I talk about in the tutorials, I, I design in rooms. I design in these rooms where it's like the oversection of like a hot microclimate and closer to the house. So it's like, it's a zone, it's a microclimate um it's it's a potential water collection and that then gives me a sense of like oh okay so if it's this close and it's this then I generally would want these types of plants and then I go and do the research to find which plants might go there well and over time if you work in the same place over and over and over again you'll get a palette of plants you know you like and you trust and you know they work well they're your hits um a lot of people in permaculture suffer from out of zone -initis where they must plant something that's five zones out and like make it work. And it's so much work. Uh, I, I borrowed this, this saying from um, a colleague and a friend of mine, Darren Darty, who runs the agrarians, which, which is let's make farming boring again in that we don't have a hundred experiments every single time. So I have no problem working with the hits. And this is where that, uh, research for the nursery and the local farms came into play. It's like those people will know what works well in your area. And if you pay them for an hour of their time, they will be more than generous with what they have to give. Or if you show up with value being like, Hey, can I, can I donate an hour of my time? You, 
I can muck out the stalls. I can do the dirtiest jobs. Doesn't matter. I just want an hour in trade so I can learn more about your plants. And they will be floored if you come at them with value. Most of them get asked for free things all the time. But if you say, hey, your time's important. The experience is important. The wisdom in your head is important. I want to value that. And you show up with value saying, I want to pay you for that. Or I want to pay with my time even better. They're so responsive. They become lifelong friends. And, uh, and that's when you learn about, oh, I didn't know that that plant did that thing. Or, oh, that's it. Like, and that's what I did with all my mentors. I just continually showed up and helped help them work on their site. I'd be like, what are you doing today? Oh, I'm just planting garlic. Great. I'll come out, give you a hand. Plant garlic for the day. They're like, you just came out and helped me? Of course I did. Like, you're somebody I want to learn from. I want to understand you. But I know that you're not a shopping mall. I don't go in and transact with people. People are not transactional. And if you ever want to piss off somebody, make sure that they feel like you're coming to them for a bag of chips. The bigger conversation is how do we relate to people as people who have histories and communities and conversations and languages and interactivities. So you can always build on top of that. The right plant in the right place is eventually where we get to, but it's not something to hold at the beginning. It's I want to harmonize with this landscape. And the great thing is, is that plants are wonderful at giving feedback they die. You messed up. You didn't do it right. <laughs> They're suffering. You messed up. This is what uh, Sepp Holter said. The book of nature is open for you to read. And when, not if you mess up, to come back and read again. Because we always mess up. It's just, I used to joke when I, when I did a lot of in-person presentations and lectures that uh, Gardner was old. Uh, uh, Gardner was murderer in old Latin. Like anybody who's a gardener has killed thousands of plants. Um, overwatered a tray of seedlings too much. Didn't water it enough. Left it out in the sun. Animal got into it. Thousands upon thousands of seeds have died um, or gone stale or been roasted or, you know, you name it. So this is what I, this is what I meant when we started this conversation. And I said, have fun with this is the more fun it is, the easier it is to go, oh, I messed up. That was a mistake. That should have gone there. Huh. Okay. Well, I've got that information now. Now onto the next thing. Now onto the next design. Or this is the great thing up until about year four or five, depending on the tree, most trees can be moved. They don't like it. They'll suffer. But it's better to move a plant to a place where it can thrive than keep it in a place where it'll always be stunted. I was just looking at my neighbor's, my neighbor's property uh, back in Ecuador. And um they were like, yeah, we've never had any, like we have trees all over the landscape, but this one spot, they never, they never su survived. It was like, did you plant them in parent soil? That's three feet away from bedrock and has no water. They're like, yeah. <laughs> and you watch them go, oh, <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're contextual general generalists. Basically we look at a landscape and we kind of, there's another great story actually that illustrates this. We were, I was teaching a, I think it was like a three or a six month PDC that was a residential at Seven Ravens uh, Permaculture Farm and Nursery. But I was also running courses through Permaculture BC back in Victoria. And I had uh, I had uh, the great Peter McCoy of, of Radical Mycology come and we did an installation of a mushroom bed at the place I was living. And I had the four students from the PDC I was teaching come plus the general public that bought tickets. And it was great because when I asked, um, is this the right place to put the bed? The general public all looked down, but my students all looked up. And it was this wonderful moment where I was like, yes, you have learned, <laughs> right? Take like taking it in, in, in firefighting and in a lot of um, militaristic organizations, this is the idea of head on a swivel, like always looking around, always looking around. And I've really adopted that when I'm designing. It's like, always looking at the tops of trees to see what the flagging is doing. Flagging is when the tip of a tree is bent over and the degree to which it is bent gives you an indication of the direction and the force of wind. I'm looking at, are we having pine needles on one side and not on the other? I'm looking at, is the vegetation changing along the ground? And if so, why? It's always a why conversation. So I came into a landscape, um, that same landscape down in Ecuador. I was noticing that there was a type of moss that was on one side, but not on the other. And I got really curious about it. And just to understand like, well, what is that? And, and there's always going to be some things that are left unknown at the end of the day. I still don't, I still don't understand that plant. That's still one of those things that's kind of a like, oh, I'll figure that out. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was years ago, I've got a racing mind. It, it, it always like more and more thoughts and they all lead to other thoughts. And when I was, uh, mentally ill, it would lead to the worst thoughts. Um, thankfully I got over that and that's now a story that I tell, but one of the things in terms of racing thoughts that comes in is, well, what am I supposed to do here? And what's the next thing to do? And what's the next thing to do? And when you can step back and really go, what am I seeing here? Or what's the why of this place? Why is that here? Again, from a curiosity perspective, it's very hard to have an emotional reaction and be curious at the same time, almost impossible. So if you can remain curious when you're designing and, and having that first site visit, the fear of getting it wrong, the fear of, of making the wrong decision or saying the wrong thing to the client almost evaporates because you're just curious. And so you come like a curious little George or Georgette and you're just like, well, why is that there? And why is that over there? And oh, that's interesting. And that all becomes data for then, as Louisa was talking about or inquiring into kind of the bigger arc of your receptivity to the site to become finely tuned. And then when somebody makes a suggestion like, hey, I've got a second growth boreal forest I really want a garlic farm. And you're like, cool, garlic's a pioneer species and you want to cut down a forest to then plant garlic. seems like a lot of work. And that then becomes your conversation about helping guide people to what, what harmonizes most with this landscape instead of force functioning something on top of it. Like for New York, if, I, if, this, were I, if this were my job, I would take a look at the biome of the area. I would take a look at the climax community. I would take a look at all the families of plants that grow there, the natives. And then I would work off of those families. So the rosaceae families, there is like simians there. Um, I would work off of those and then find choice select cultivars that absolutely worked in that biome. I don't know if anybody saw this, but the USDA just released the first update to the plant hardiness zone for the US um, like four or five days ago. Everybody basically moved up a half zone, um, which really just tells you what the coldest uh, coldest possible temperature is in winter. Uh, it doesn't tell you anything about, you know, degree days or cool days or any of that. But all that information kind of gives you the sense of what's next. And if you can keep it light and keep it playful, um, it becomes a lot of fun and it doesn't become like a, oh, I've been the wrong plant in the wrong place. So I hear you, Sam. I hear you completely. It's uh, it's something that uh, I dealt with and still deal with to this day. I still have to challenge the parts of me that go, I must get it right. If I don't get it right, I'm a terrible person. That never really goes away, but you can manage it. You can manage it. Any other questions? Well, it's been a slice. It's been super fun. Um, we've had 20 weeks together. We've gone through, some of you have gone through these weeks, uh, some of these weeks twice. Um, what I'll say is this, as you come out of a PDC, sometimes there's a little bit of sadness or frustration because you're kind of out of a, a collective group that thinks the same way that you do. And one of the most important things I did post PDC is to, to reach out with local people I could meet full time to have conversations, meet with, create designs with, put things in the ground, create permablitz networks, things like that. Um, and so that was my my approach because I like bringing people together. It's something I enjoy. Um, not everyone does. I like talking, not everyone does. Um, and I like sharing, not everyone does. So I did the things that were native to me, but connecting with others was really important or connecting with others that aren't local, but are really enthusiastic that you can talk to. So if you don't have a permaculture group in your area, I highly recommend starting one. Make it, make the bar low, like meet once a season. And then if it gets popular, meet once a month. Um, and basically just host conversations. And sometimes it's hosting movies, which is easy because if you don't have anybody who's really skilled at the beginning, you can talk about this thing, this movie you watched or invite people in to talk. Um, Zoom has made it possible for pretty much anybody to talk about anything anywhere in the world. And then as you become more skilled, you'll be in a place to actually speak on something that you're working on, uh, a site. I'm, I'm mentoring a former student in the OSU PDC um, in her design business. And we talked about her language. What is her language for reputation? And um, she doesn't mind talking to video. She doesn't want to talk in front of people, but she's an artist. So she's very visually 
visually focus. So we're just working with the marketing or the reputation building that works with her, which is taking lots of photos of her, of her projects and talking to video and then sharing that with the wider community. So that's first. Meet with local people, raise your, your freak flag, find the other uh, plant and permaculture geeks and, uh, and have that conversation. If you can, get to a local, regional, national or international gathering around permaculture. Um, the IPC of 2024 is happening in Taiwan at the end of the year. I'm strongly thinking about going and 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 seeing that side of the world. I I'm I've I've always wanted to go to that side of the world and, and meet with others like that. So uh, the local regional PDC gatherings I've gone to, the convergences have just been phenomenal to open my mind to other ideas and people, and it's so brilliant. And then there's tons of summits that are happening online, either through Matt Powers or others. There's just lots of people hosting good conversations that can create good interest. You're going into design, I would say of the three stools that you need to make, the three stool legs to make a business, you need to have craftsmanship. So you need to be able to do your craft well. You have to be a good craftsperson. You need to have reputation. So people need to know what it is you do. And you need to have smooth and simple business systems. So all those threes have to, all those three have to build in tandem. And so you've started the craftsmanship. You've started that process. You're building that process. And then be very conscientious about your weaknesses and target your weaknesses first. So if plant ID or understanding plants is the weakness, get a job at a nursery, go and work for a conventional landscaping company, work at a farm, um, find places to build out your, 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 your um, capacity and realize that confidence is really competence manifest. A lot of people say, well, I'm not confident enough then you haven't done it enough. It's really about competence, unless it's a personal issue or a personal resistance or a mental health issue. It's usually about time on a project. Um, I didn't feel competent in this space until about year five. And I still have moments where I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. This is ridiculous. And then I employ a design process called red team design, where I bring in um, other designers to look at my work and I give them, give them the red pen give them the red pen and I go, tell me why I'm wrong. And that changed my ability to design exponentially because I learned things I wouldn't have thought of because uh, I gave others permissions to tell me why I was wrong. And when I still thought I was right, I would chow, I would fight them for the point. And sometimes I won and sometimes I lost. The, the, that actually doesn't matter. The big point is, did I learn? Did I become a better designer in the process? Sometimes working for conventional landscape companies, I did it a few times, Learned, uh, really taught me about process flow and best practices and things that as a more ecological regenerative landscape designer, I wouldn't have thought of, which has been phenomenal. I've been open to so many different viewpoints and processes that um, it's just been great. And then the other aspect is, and this is interesting because I'm working with um, a, a woman who's 105 pounds and, and did this approach, but then hurt herself and now can't lift more than 20 pounds. Be conscientious about what you can do in a physical setting. If you do decide to work on a farm or work with a landscape designer, be conscientious about what you can do and just tell them up front before they hire you or agree to have you volunteer, like happy to work, happy to move, happy to do these things, but I have to say no at a certain weight level limit. So that might mean less in the wheelbarrow or moving less things. Um, chronic injuries, body injuries suck. And uh if I could go back and fix some of the construction injuries I sustained, I would have. Um, it's been brutal to have a low back issue. It means I can't do a lot for a long time. And then once you have a sense of that that craftsmanship, you know, play with reputation building in terms of telling people what it is you're doing. If you're not willing to hang a shingle, don't go into this work. Don't go into any new work, <laughs> truthfully. If you're not willing to tell people what it is you do, it's going to be next to impossible to get people in through the door. So find a venue that works for you. Uh, Tad Hargrave's Marketing for Hippies, good friend of mine. Um, great processes, great eBooks, great everything, great processes. A lot of the processes I work with, with my clients came directly from Tad and I've just augmented them. But his, his big advice is um, the marketing you do is the marketing that works. I have for 15 years told myself I should write blogs. I still, to this day, think I should do it. I've written, I've written like four. I don't like writing long form content unless I'm truly inspired. 
can I talk on a screen to people for hours on end? hundred percent. Can I do podcasts? hundred percent. Can I make videos? I can record them. I just can't edit them. I've learned that very well. <laughs> I can, I can put it all together, but I just don't, I, I just don't take the time to edit them. So you don't see a lot of that video work. But if you look at my channel, most of the video work is all of these office hours because I have all this experience and I can express it. So just be conscientious about that. And then in terms of hub marketing, all the people you might want to work with, they all come together in one place, a hub, like the hub of a wheel of a, uh, then they're all the spokes. So be conscientious about putting your efforts where people are. Sometimes this means going and talking at gardening clubs or going to the local natural food store and talking there. Sometimes it means about posting content specific to what you're doing. It's incredible how many people are sent to this course from um, landscape designers, permaculture designers that have gotten onto TikTok and have millions of people following them. Um, great use of what seems to be a terrible technology generally on the other side of the effects it has. But the ability to have people go, oh, I saw permaculture on TikTok and I had to come to OSU because that's the course that that person took and that's what they talked about. It's incredible. Similarly, if you talk to people about what it is you do, they're going to go, oh, my sister needs somebody. Hey, I saw this cool person on TikTok or I saw this thing on Facebook or I saw this thing on Instagram or I saw this flyer up by the, the local shop. So that's kind of the whole business conversation truncated into a really uh, small conversation. The last thing I'll say <clears throat> on that subject, because I noticed we're, we're over time, is there's a great book uh, by uh, Derek Sivers, S-I-V-E-R-S, -E Derek Sivers, called Anything You Want. He created the first uh, ever online music sales store where you could physically buy CDs called CD Baby. It's a really short read. If you listen to it, it's like two and a half hours, depending on your reading uh, speed, it'd be more or less than that. Um, but he has this great quote, which is, your business is your view of utopia. It's your version of utopia. It can be anything you want. So the way you interact with clients, the work you do, how you do it, may not mean that there's uh, an audience for what you do, but if you're going to start a business, don't emulate a lot of practices that you already dislike from somebody else. Really focus on like what's enjoyable to you. What do you like putting down? And then make sure you photograph everything. Make sure you take great befores and great after photos because the number one thing, the number one thing that'll get your clients is a good portfolio. So people can look at the work and go, yep, this person knows what they're doing. All right, that is my very quick down and dirty conversation about what's next. Any follow-up questions or comments from that before we close out? Okay, I'm just seeing smiling, nodding faces. All right, folks. Well, if you have any questions about your final design, feel free to reach out to at allpointsdesign.ca. If you need a little bit of more time or some, some Zoom conversations, we can do that. It's been a great pleasure chatting with all of you who are here live and all of you who are watching after the fact. Um, if you need help in the future, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to give anybody 20 minutes. Um, but uh, if you need more time, we can always talk about what that might look like. But uh, yeah, it's been a great pleasure. And I really hope we see each other in the future. Lots of great courses coming up at regenerativeliving.online and also with OSU. All right. Take care. And uh, hope it's been a great course for everybody. Ah, thank you. Thanks so much. You're welcome.